Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society, and the Boston Public Library. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, NEHGS, and a producer of the series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of American history in the 19th century for a heroic story that starts in Macon, Georgia, and continues through the South and the Mid-Atlantic states to New England and Canada, across the ocean and back. On your screen is a schedule for our hour-long event centered on a remarkable and celebrated book of Black history just out in paperback, Master, Servant, Husband, Wife, An Epic Journey from Slavery to Freedom by Dr. Ilian Wu. Soon, Ilian will take the screen to give us background on this tale and share images. Then she'll be joined by a special guest for a unique conversation and some family history. At the end of their time, we'll address some of your advanced questions. Thank you for sharing those as you registered. If you have another pressing question, do enter it into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and Kristen and I will hope to get one or to one of two of those as well. Tonight's event is being recorded by my colleagues in the Brew Family Learning Center. Their video will be published on our website in the day ahead. All registered attendees will be emailed the link, which is also now being added in the chat. Of course, the real education comes from reading tonight's featured work, Master, Servant, Husband, Wife, which you can take out from the Boston Public Library or your local library, or you can own for yourself. Copies can be purchased from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And lucky for you, tonight's author is local to Boston, so you can get not just a signed copy, but a personalized copy, personalized with any name or message that you would like. As always with our partners at Porter Square, you can have your book sent anywhere in the United States to yourself or sent to others as a gift. However you do it, I recommend that you read this book as it offers an amazing window into a time past, a tragic component of our country's history. Now, for further background on our author and her work, welcome to you, Kristen, my counterpoint at the Boston Public Library. Thank you, Margaret, and welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, as Margaret said, I'm Kristen Motti. I'm a programs librarian, a member of the programs team at the library, and we are thrilled to be here with our neighbors at the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston to present tonight's program in commemoration of Black History Month. We have two special guests this evening, and I have the honor of introducing one of them, tonight's featured author, Ilian Wu. Dr. Ilian Wu is the New York Times bestselling author of Master Slave, Husband, Wife, An Epic journey, journey from Slavery to Freedom, a New York Times top 10 book of the year, and a Kirkus Prize finalist, also named Best Book of the Year by Oprah Quarterly, NPR, Time, and Smithsonian Magazine. She is previously the author of The Great Divorce, a 19th century mother's extraordinary fight against her husband, the Shakers, and her times. Wu's writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, and the New York Times, and she has received support for her research from the Whitting Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among other institutions. She holds a BA in the Humanities from Yale College and a PhD in English from Columbia University. We'll meet Ilian Wu in just a moment, but first, Margaret, back over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Our special guest tonight uh, in conversation will be Peggy Trotter Damon Priestley. She is one of the great great granddaughters of the international abolitionists William and Ellen Craft, featured in tonight's book. She is also the grandniece of Boston civil rights activist and publisher William Monroe Trotter. 
Miss Peggy has been an activist and poet since the 1960s. She has been jailed three times for her activities, which included registering rural Black voters in southwest Georgia, not far from where her ancestors were once enslaved. She has a master's in public health and is a contributing author of Hands on the Freedom Plow, personal accounts of the women of the SNCC. She performs her poetry and speaks around the country about literacy and social justice. Uh, Miss Peggy will join us in 10 to 15 minutes. But for now, um, Kristen and I want to welcome our featured author, um, Dr. Wu Ilian, as she's asked us to call her. Um, what an honor it is to have you with us, sharing a story that everyone is talking about. I mentioned this uh, uh, off screen, but really, not it's not just the book critics. It's my own sister and her book club who absolutely loved your book um, and the telling of the tale. And I'm also hearing from my neighbors here in Brookline, Massachusetts, as one of the craft's hiding houses, the Philbrook House, um, is just around the corner from us. So to my mind, Ilian, you are everywhere, which is so appropriate in this month. And, um, and Kristen and I and everybody in the audience, we've got really a record crowd. Um, we can't wait to hear from you. So over to you for more on this book. And we look forward to hearing from Miss Peggy as well. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and for giving me this opportunity to speak with us, Peggy, and also to share with you some um, stories and pictures, which are like among my favorite things. So let me see if I can do some of that sharing now. Ta-da, are we visible? Okay, great. So. Let's dive into the world of master-slave husband-wife. First, I want to start wide. Grab a super wide-angle lens, big as we can get it, epic. This is American inspiration, after all, or even more than that, the story of Ellen and William Craft is the history of global inspiration. So here's a cross-section of the world in 1848, as the Crafts were soon to travel it. This was a year of not only the craft's own personal revolution, but worldwide revolt, a time of epic change in transportation, information, news. Here's what Frederick Douglass would say of this transformative era. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea, as well as on earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space, he said, is comparatively annihilated. Now let's annihilate that distance in space and time together by getting up close to 1848. In the United States of America, into the state of Georgia, into the city of Macon, inside a slave cabin behind this mansion. We land with this young couple, William and Ellen Craft, 4 a.m. on a December morning in our year of revolution, 1848. It's 4 a.m. on this December morning and they've got everything ready. Ellen has her tall hat her green glasses, her gentleman's boots, transformed and ready to step from this slave cabin into the journey of a lifetime. So here's where they hope to go. Past the mansion of Ellen's enslaver on Mulberry Street, through town and across the Fifth Street Bridge to the Central of Georgia Railroad. By train then to Savannah, Georgia, by steamship from Savannah to Charleston, with a final steamship from Charleston to Philadelphia and then onto Canada, where they will be free. A journey in four beats, but this journey will not go as planned. Running much longer with many more stops and accidents than they could ever have imagined. Neither will they follow their North Star to Canada, choosing instead far more treacherous roads that will lead to celebrity and activism, wild crowds in Faneuil Hall, but also a terrible slave hunt in Boston where people now asleep in Macon will have them in their sights. All of this and more is yet to come. 
We will return to the point of the craft departure at the very end of our time together tonight, which will close with a reading. But for now, I'd like to share with you a bit about how I first encountered this extraordinary couple and their story. So I first met the crafts, if you will, through the power of their own words, through a narrative they wrote entitled, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. I read their words for the first time while in graduate school at Columbia. I was in the Star East Asian Library sitting down with my course reader when I entered a world via a voice unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It was a voice that told a love story, an adventure story, a story of self-emancipation that seemed to defy belief. Narrating the journey of this couple, Ellen and William Craft, who we've paused with in the cabin. Now the story was loaded with hair-raising moments that began as soon as they arrived at that central Georgia railroad station. William Kraft's employer, he had the strange premonition that something was going on and he starts checking the railroad cars for William. That's just the beginning. It was for me an absolute page turner. And yet it was short, only 60 pages long, with many of those pages completely unconnected to the Kraft's direct experiences and with very little about the before or the after of their celebrated escape, making me want to know more. So the crafts themselves make it clear from the very first page of their narrative that this is not going to be a full account of their lives. There's too much at stake. Why? Because even though they publish their narrative about 12 years after their journey, when they are on the other side of the ocean from their enslavers, Ellen Craft's beloved mother remains in bondage, enslaved by the wife of Ellen Craft's biological father. Now, I know that's complicated, so let me pause for a moment to explain. The Crafts give us this one line in their book about Ellen and her family, told in William's voice. My wife's first master was her father, and her mother his slave, and the latter is still the slave of his widow. It was this widow who gave Ellen away as a wedding present to her own daughter and Ellen's half-sister when Ellen was only 11 years old. So who was this mother of Ellen Craft? Who were these people? The father, the wife, who were the Crafts themselves? What prompted their escape? How did they get the idea, let alone execute it? How did they choose to live their lives in freedom? These were some of the many questions I had when I put down their story for the first time, and they remained. So fast forward about 20 years, I never really stopped thinking about the crafts and their story, but I didn't exactly intend to write about them either. You might say that I wanted to read the book I finally wrote, but I remained curious, and that curiosity led me to make in Georgia, where I made two resolutions that lead me directly to the present moment. On this day in Macon, I opened a giant 19th century tome to discover the paper, the deed by which James Smith legally gifted his daughter, Eliza Collins, with some valuable property, which included a girl named Ellen. It was startling to see this piece of paper and this gorgeous script, which performed such a horrific act. Ellen would be traumatized by the separation from her beloved mother, refusing to get married or have children for years, fearful of repeating the experience, this time as a mother. In this document, there's a particular word that stood out to me, love. James Smith writes that it is for the love and goodwill he bears for his daughter, Eliza Collins, that he gives her this property, which happens to be another daughter, Ellen. It's on the day that I found this paper that I resolved to write about the crafts to honor their love. But there's a second resolution I came to that day. I wanted to find the crafts descendants, to take the pieces of history I'd begun amassing and make a book of some kind for them. Now the journey that sprang from the first resolution was just a researcher's dream. I traced the counters of the craft's epic escape and the archives and in person, pouring over old maps and ledgers, letters, you name it, across the country and across the world. 
Boston plays a central role in the story, and you too can trace the craft steps here through Beacon Hill and other areas of Boston that remain in many ways as they were. In fact, I believe the New England Historic Genealogical Society was in existence at the craft's time as well, formed in 1845, though Back Bay was at that point a pretty gross and stinky marsh. You'll see there's no Back Bay in this 1848 map. Now, indispensable to my own research journey was a collection in Boston, and that is no other than the Boston Public Library with its incredible trove of anti-slavery manuscripts. These include, as you can see here, an original letter written by Ellen Craft. Now, I happen to be near Boston, but whether or not you're geographically close, you too can access much of this archival material as well, because it's beautifully digitized. And I thank my stars as it was, because you can see from this picture, I was research and writing, researching and writing through the pandemic. And I will state here that without the Boston Public Library's uh, collections, and not only that, but without its generous digi digitization of its collections, it would not have been able to it would not have been possible for me to write this book as I did, one where I endeavored to summon the crafts, but also their community, their world. And here's one of the many collages I made to remind myself of the vastness of the community and their world. So I hope you'll see the results for yourself in my book, and here are the end papers, which I completed as a fulfillment of that first resolution I made in Macon to summon the story of the crafts as fully as I could. Now for the second, the descendants. The experiences I eventually had in meeting the descendants of the Kraft family went beyond my greatest imagining. I could never have dreamed that I would stand at the grave site of William Kraft in Charleston with three of the Kraft's great, great granddaughters or that they would attend a book party at the home of my editor, one of my editors, Don Davis, but I did dream of making and handing over a special book of archival materials for someone in their family line, even though I did not yet know who that might be. And that person, I'm honored to say, is my guest in conversation tonight. So before I introduce you, I wanna draw lines to the present. Here are, in the top left, Eleanor William Craft, with their first freeborn child, as they call him, Charles Estlin Phillips Craft, and his child, Henry Kempton Craft, and his child, Ellen Kinlock Craft Damond, and her child, Peggy Trotter Damond Priestley. This latest descendant of the Crafts has practiced the legacy of her ancestors in so many ways, as an oral historian, activist, freedom writer, community organizer, poet, and more. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to this descendant, a great, great granddaughter of William and Ellen Craft, who I'm grateful to call my friend. And now may our new conversation begin. I'm hoping that Miss Peggy may join me on the on the uh, screen. There she is. <laughs> Hi, Elian. Hello, how are you, Miss Peggy? I am well, and thank you so much for including me today. It's such a pleasure to see you and to see Ellen uh, Craft in your background there. Yes, wonderful. So can you tell me first, just to get started right away, um, how did you first learn about the craft story? Well, I just wanted to say there's so much information that you asked me to look into that I did write some notes. So if you will <laughs> forgive me, I'll write some of them down. But as one of the nine American-born great-great-grandchildren of William and Ellen, I first learned the story from my grandfather, Henry K. Kraft, who was the eldest grandchild of William and Ellen. My Gramps, as we called him, was born in 1883 in Charleston, South Carolina, where he was known and know, knew his famous grandparents as a child with his younger sister, Julia Ellen Kraft da Costa. But it was actually my grandfather's youngest daughter, who, as you showed on the screen, who was my mother, Ellen Kinlaw Kraft Damon. And she was a natural griot or storyteller, as we call it in the African tradition. And she's the one who actually taught my younger brother, Henry Kraft Damon, and myself to read 
because she insisted that we would read the story that was written in 1872 in William Still's Underground Railroad book. And we were only five and seven years old at the time, growing up in Harlem. However, we didn't see a copy of the Kraft's own book until 1969, um, when it was print, reprinted in America. But by then, my brother Henry and I had had children of our own. My children are Christopher Trotter Day and Shanti Kraft Moore Day. And my brother's children are Tokia and Lalu Trotter Damon and their half-sister Dorianne Lambley Coleman. And they also learned a story from my mother, their grandmother, whom they called Mama D, who passed in 2007. So eventually our children had children, Dominique, Simone, and Tasia Day, and Kaylin Kraft Day Lyons, Isaiah Noel Day Lyons, my grandchildren, and Clara and Isabel Damon Greider and Simon Damon, who are my brother's grandchildren. So each generation of craft descendants learns about their craft ancestors. And even my five great grandchildren, Dakota, Savannah, and Darren Porter, and Maya and DJ Day, are also learning the story, although they are under 10. And the story is passed down, of course, not only through our family oral history, but they also have the opportunity to learn the craft legacy from film, print, and digital versions as well. How wonderful. Um, when it comes to your experience of the story, how did the story of the crafts guide you in your life? Um, can you share with us one pivotal moment um, where you remember the story coming in? Sure. <clears throat> as I said, my, my ancestor's story has guided me all my life because my mother and her older sister, Virginia Craft Rose, they kept the story alive for us as children. They told us it was in our blood and in our souls and that it was up to us to carry it forth. So even when my cousins, Rick, Gia and Mary Rose and I may not have been listening when we were growing up in New York and California, so far from the South where our ancestors were from and where my other craft cousins, Gail, Margaret, Vicki and Julia Ellen lived, we must have been listening, we thought. Because when we became teenagers and young adults, we too shared that story of our famous ancestors. And we challenged and we corrected our history teachers about the reality of slavery and black resistance and resilience, which our ancestors had demonstrated. So you asked me about one pivotal moment and it occurred to me that it was during the summer of 1962 when I was a teenager working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC, in the Deep South. I was teaching voter registration and literacy in rural Georgia. About 150 years later, and only about 100 miles from where the crafts had once been enslaved. Mm -hmm. I was standing in a cotton field, helping sharecroppers make their daily quota, when I had what I call an out-of-body experience. I actually felt my great-great-grandparents, their presence, and I heard them calling to me to just carry on. It gave me chills that I remember to this day. And so I've tried to live my life by carrying on for freedom, justice, and equality, not only in what I say, but what I do. What a beautiful short story. Thank you for sharing that moment with us, really. Yeah. Um, I want to turn for a moment to somebody else who carried on um, with a secret. I know that her whole story could like, you know, fill a whole volume. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit about your mother and, and about her secret mission? Yes, I certainly can. Um, my mother was part of a group that of women, interracial group of women who traveled secretly to the South in 1965 as a part of the National Council of Negro Women and with the American Jewish Council of Women. And these were women who in 1965 were the mothers or sisters of those of us that had been teenagers in the South. 
But because it was a secret mission, my mom didn't tell me about it for over 20 years because she, she was told, don't tell anyone. And the reason was, is that black and white women from the North went to Jackson, Mississippi to work behind the scenes, behind the cotton curtain, behind the curtain of hate with black and white women who were living in Jackson. And some of the white women were actually mothers, sisters and wives of the Klan and of other groups like the White Citizens Council. So we knew that we couldn't endanger, they knew that they couldn't endanger them. So it was called Wednesdays in Mississippi. That's the name of the organization and the mission. And they, on Wednesdays in 1964 and 65, various women across different uh, racial and religious lines got in a secret plane and they flew to Jackson and were ferried to uh, places that no one would see initially. And they worked to have social change. This was such an important mission because they originally, they initially established the Head Start program there and other social programs that exist to this day. There is a film being made about this mission called Wednesdays in Mississippi. And we really hope that some of the women who were interviewed, including my mom, will be able to tell their stories. Amazing. I mean, secret missions, activism, <laughs> education, all these things, you know, there's so many ways in which you and your family have lived out the legacy of your ancestors. Um, thank you. So I want to shift a little bit. Um, we have a wonderful mutual friend in common who actually yes. we got to meet together the other <laughs> week, right? Can mm -hmm. you tell us? Uh, can you tell the story of how we met? I will. Um, I was introduced to you, Ilian, in a phone call from a mutual friend, honorary Oscar award-winning filmmaker Charles Burnett. You had worked with him as an assistant director on a film he was making in Korea. And a few years later, Charles remembered that you had mentioned that you were researching a book about William and Ellen Craft. And so he introduced us. And ever since then, you and I have not stopped talking or <laughs> collaborating. And it's been, for me, a really joyous and inspirational experience for both of us um, and for our, our entire Craft family, because you reached out and you've met almost all of us descendants across the country. And you've shown our family great respect and appreciation as you continue to tell our story with our permission. Thank you. That means the world to me. I have up on my wall, actually, uh, a letter that you wrote after reading uh, my book for the first time or the manuscript. And I am I guess I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what your thoughts were um, after reading the book. Like, was it what you expected? <laughs> There's so many thoughts, it was hard to figure out which ones to talk about. But um, since I've known my great-great-grandparents' story for most of my life, I really wasn't prepared to learn so many of the details that you uncovered. And also so much about the era and the times that they lived from the 1840s into the 1890s. Your book places the crafts at an epicenter of abolitionist activities, both in America and in the world. And I really had not known, you know, what to expect because I hadn't read your first book. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't, I was unprepared for your remarkable gift as a writer, but also for your remarkable examination of slavery in the context of global re revolutions, world events, and American history. I also, because I'm not a researcher, I came to learn and appreciate the use of what you call open source code, which invites readers to further explore the sources that you use to support your findings. So I think that's really excellent. Other researchers and historians such as Blackett and Sterling and McCaskill have written excellent books too, but it's your skill and the attention that you pay to detail and the fact that you've written a narrative nonfiction book that really impressed and delighted me. So you exceeded my expectations. <laughs> Thank you. That means the world. Um, well, can you tell me one thing uh, that you that might have surprised you or that you learned about Ellen Craft from the book? 
That was such a hard question to think about. <laughs> and I don't know if I would use the word surprising. I would rather mm -hmm. say how awesome my great great grandmother Ellen Kraft was. And I'm continuously amazed at her ability to skillfully and successfully manage, quote unquote, being suspended somewhere between slavery and freedom throughout her life, as historian Barbara McCaskill wrote, but particularly as a formerly enslaved Black woman living in Victorian male-dominated times. Mm -hmm. Ellen navigated this era in both America and in Great Britain for more than 50 years, seeming to seamlessly and successfully adapt to a multitude of changing places, times, situations. And the way that Ellen is initially presented through their own book that they wrote, Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom, didn't even have Ellen's name listed as author. And we know now that she was, of course, a co-author. So this demonstrated what my grandmother was certainly a victim or a casualty of Victorian customs and mores of the time, when the voice and presence of women was either not permitted or even recognized, and certainly not a Black formerly enslaved woman, not at all. However, what also intrigued me that you wrote about was the strategic in Ellen's silences when she was on stage with her husband or other male spokesman people and her demeanor and her presence of self just spoke volumes even without her saying anything. So through your book, um, I found that her public and personal persona merged for me. And I lift up and applaud my great-great-grandmother as a legendary Black female icon and a true heroine of our people. Thank you. One of the things that interests me about, um, I guess, her rep representation in the book that they co-author is that she's, you know, trembling and she's afraid. Uh, she doesn't want to wear the costume. William kind of has to talk her into it. She's uh, retiring. I mean, all these things, they had to present her that way yes. because she otherwise I mean here's a woman who puts a man's pants on you know here's uh <laughs> she she is breaking all the rules so she had right. to appear retiring she had to as you say play this sort of um uh Victorian heroine figure but actually in real life when you get little snippets of uh of you know she's she's a as sharp and witty and sometimes as barbed as as William was known to be. Um, right. There's that one line where somebody asks, uh, how, uh, what, how did they put it? They said, like, how do we know that enslaved people, if they're free, how, how, how are they going to be able to take care of themselves? Will they be able to take care of themselves? Do you remember what she says back? No, but I know that we took care of them. So <laughs> that's exactly what she said. That's exactly what she said. She said, well, yeah. right now they're taking care of everybody else and themselves. I would think that she, they'd be able to take care of themselves only. You know, yeah. she just like, you know, it, it's like a, it's a big zinger. Um, and there yeah. are other moments like where she's in England and she's singing a song. And it turns out the song that she's actually singing that somebody's overhearing her sing is a, called A Fugitive's Triumph. So she's singing the song of her own triumph um, while she's overseas. I love how resistant she is. Um, and uh, I mean, what an activist, what an amazing lady. Yeah, um, so true. Can we turn to uh, William as well? Like what, what is one thing that might have surprised him about you? Oh, sorry, well, surprised you about him. <laughs> William, William, William. <laughs> I, I, you know, I grew up hearing more about Ellen Craft because of her disguise and everything, but mm -hmm. I've been drilling down about William for the last 10 years. Uh, he was just an amazing person. I, I would say he was an architect of his own life, even from the time that he was a young boy of 10 and was enslaved in a cabinet shop in Macon, Georgia, where he would work for the next 14 years of his life. Because he was, he had ingenuity, he had intelligence, and he was a keen observer of people. So, for example, he eventually he convinced his last owner, the cabinet maker Ira Taylor, to allow William to pay the owner a sum of two hundred and twenty dollars a year 
for the opportunity to, quote, hire himself out to make additional money so that he, William, could keep it. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what I was thinking about is that William was coercing his slave owner to treat him more like an employee than an, empl an, an enslaved person. So white slave owners continually, as we know, underestimated the intelligence and ingenuity of black enslaved people, only to be surprised and, and outsmarted again and again and again. So it's ironic as we look back, Ilian, at the funds that William accrued during this period of time that he actually used those funds to buy the clothes and the disguise for Ellen that they later used in their escape in 1848. But the other part of, about William that is so important to me is that he went to Africa himself. He convinced again with his ingenuity the um, members of the free produce movement in England to sponsor his travel to Dahomey, which is now Benin, to try and convince the kings of the region to halt the slave trade right at its source and grow cotton instead of selling human beings. I mean, how bold was that? How yeah. bold was that? But the kings refused. And in a shocking way, they awarded William five to 50 slaves over three different times. And he was shocked, of course, because being having been enslaved himself, he would not accept slaves. So he immediately set them free and directed that they be sent to a Christian school in Wida on the coast where he had developing a school. So William keeps impressing me, environing me with his knowledge, his intelligence, his adventurous spirit. So it's important to remember, I think, that some of these same skill sets that William employed in the 1800s are still required among Black people today as we navigate the troubling and adversarial waters of our times. So William's life never ceases to amaze me and make me so proud to be one of his descendants. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. He was amazing. <laughs> he was. I mean, they were both amazing. And you think about, I mean, when he released uh, all those people from captivity, that was a huge sacrifice for himself because... The, he lost the, money, didn't he? Exactly. He lost the money. He was yeah. made personally responsible mm -hmm. for all that, all, 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 all of the financial worth that they represented, right. Right. Um, and that caused them huge trouble. Uh, yeah. But he did it knowingly. Um, yeah. the, the ways in which your ancestors um, rose up and made these incredible personal sacrifices repeatedly—it's just—it's uh, really um, mind blowing. I'm so proud of them. <laughs> So um, one more question about the book, if I may. Okay. What is your, did you have a favorite part of the book? Yes, I did. And <laughs> it's about your friend and mine, William Wells Brown. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I learned so much about him. His book is holding up my computer right now, as a matter <laughs> of fact. And it was because he was a fugitive slave. He was an abolitionist. He was a lecturer. He was a travelogue. He was a writer travelogue writer. He was a novelist and a performer, and he had such a major influence on my grand, great-great-grandparents. In fact, he was probably the essential tutor that they had for their lectures and performances, which were cleverly aimed, as you mentioned, at doing the right thing to recruit white people to the abolitionist cause in America, as well as later in England. And you state that Brown coached and tutored the crafts in speaking to the crowds, that he even wrote letters for them on their behalf, and he contributed greatly to their public persona. But it's interesting that in an age without the social media and the World Wide Web but that we now have, Wells Brown, as I call him, was certainly ahead of his time. In his use of the 18th and early 19th century visual aid known as the panorama, which he cleverly employed to appropriate telling the story of Black liberation. William Wells Brown, however, is only one of the many unknown or lesser known characters that your book so skillfully presents to help us appreciate the complexities of the era. And I wish we had a picture of that panorama to show. I know. Wouldn't and that be amazing? We could, yes, it, it, you do describe it so much in the book, but it, it's something that today's 
filmmakers and visual artists uh, certainly can perhaps revisit and ways to go about telling the story of enslavement. I hope that somebody would make one. I mean, I, I mean, do that's too. An amazing thing to see this giant painting. Yeah, um, maybe maybe I'll get one of the freedom schools here to do that. We have that freedom be, schools. Yeah, that would be incredible. I mean, yes. it, it could be a mural. It could be an outdoor panorama. Yes, uh, yeah. And, it was amazing. He rolled it up and took it and traveled with it. Can it, you imagine? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And, you know, the weird thing is that, I mean, the crafts mentioned a few of the people who helped them in their book, but it it struck me as very strange uh, that he's not mentioned at no, all. No, no, no. We don't so, really know what that yeah. relationship ended up to be or what happened. I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I was speaking with Ezra Greenspan, the the biographer of William Wells Brown, he, the, upon whose book you your your uh, laptop computer is sitting. Up. Yeah, <laughs> mine is right back here. Um, it's big. It's wonderful. Um, but we he we, I don't know. We were thinking that maybe there was some kind of falling out. Yeah, that's one of those know. things that we'll never know. Um, so my penultimate question is, why is it important for scholars and descendants, people like you and me, to work together? So what does this kind of collaboration make possible? Yeah. Uh, this was a really important question to me, um, because as descendants of formerly enslaved ancestors, we carry what I call a sacred responsibility to speak the truth about what our ancestors endured, which is the trauma of slavery in America and in the world. According to an author that I've read, Elizabeth Rossner, and I quote, the intergenerational inheritance of trauma is passed down through subsequent generations in the legacies we have already known in our bones, our dreams, and our terrors. And she skillfully presents this in her book, Survivor Cafe, the legacy of trauma and the labyrinth of memory. So when I was thinking about your question, I realized that living descendants can provide a crucial and often unknown context to what historians are researching or writing about. Even though our own oral history and family rec 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 recollections can shed new light on previous unshared memories or secrets, they may be painful and they may challenge facts of previous investigations and what we already know. So it's important that descendants collaborate with historians. And I believe that it's a sign of respect, which you've certainly shown to our family, to do this collaboration because of the extreme trauma of slavery. So ideally, scholar, descendant, collaboration will open new doors and windows to a shared past, not only by the per perpetrators, but also by the victims as well. Thank you. I know that yeah. my own view of the crafts and their story of history um, and actually of the present day as well have all been transformed from knowing you and your family. And I thank you. Yeah. So why is it important for us to know the story today? I have a lot to say on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but basically, it's what the crafts did after they were free, after they got themselves free, that I think is so extraordinary. Not only did they self-liberate, flee to the North, learn to read and write, speak out at risk of being caught, emigrate to England with slave catchers right at their heels, become part of the internationalist, international abolitionist movement, establish themselves in businesses in England, in a British white society, raise and educate five children. But after the Civil War ended, mm -hmm. they returned to America with their children, to an America that was deep in the throes of reconstruction and white supremacy. And what did they do? They founded two schools for newly freed slaves and slave people in the same state of Georgia, one in South Carolina that was burned down by the Klan, the other in Woodville, Georgia, less than 100 miles from where they'd been enslaved. So I ask you, if the craft's life and story then is not a preeminently and essential American story, 
one that is about overcoming adversity, transformation, hard work, and becoming exemplary members of society, then I don't know what is. They were truly American heroes. Thank you. So, American thank inspiration. You. There we have it. There we go. We're on the right program. <laughs> <laughs> So I think at this point we turn to Q &A. some audience questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that remarkable dialogue. Um, we're just so feel so lucky to be flies on the wall here listening to you two talking. Thank you. Um, so Kristen and I have been going through audience questions that we've gotten in in advance and also some live. Um, and we've just um, picked a couple. Kristen, do you want to start? Go right ahead. Sure. Um so, Ilian, you had mentioned a little bit about how important the Boston Public Library's archives were to the research process. Can you speak to other aspects of that process and how this book came to be with your reading and, re and research and writing? So other archives that were important or just researching in, in general? I mean, um, you know, I think having that digital experience of the Boston Public Library's collections was essential during the pandemic when I didn't have, I, I couldn't, no one could get into, in to see any of these materials. But there was a picture that I showed that I didn't actually talk about, but it, it looked almost like a graphic because there were all these letters going this way and then more letters going that way. It's like an example of what is impossible to read and why you actually, when you actually go there and you hold these, well, you can't, they don't let you touch them, but when you're actually like physically really near these manuscripts, there is kind of a living, breathing feeling with them and you can decipher them um, in person in ways that it's, it's, it is impossible to do from that distance. So I urge everybody to, to, to try that, to go into an archive wherever you may be and and read these old diaries and letters and allow that history to speak to you because for me that is really what um what brought the history alive and into the present and i want to say something about that you know they're not teaching cursive writing anymore mm -hmm. so so many young people are not able to read script up in which a lot of the letters were written yeah, i don't know what's going to happen with that i don't know i don't know <laughs> AI, AI will do something with it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I have a question here. And um, you asked this question, Ilian, of Peggy, and um, an audience member wants to ask the same of you. And they actually sent it in a couple of days ago. Um, what piece of information did you seek, um, but were either unable to find or to corroborate? Uh, I know that you talked about a bunch of awesome things that Peggy had seen awesome things, not just things she couldn't find, but awesome things were found. So what what awesome things did you f not find that you were looking for? How did you work around it? I, I wouldn't call this awesome, but one haunting question that I, I have, and maybe you can talk about this a bit, Miss Peggy, as well, is whether the crafts might have had children in bondage, whether Ellen Craft in particular might have had a baby. So there are... I think at the time that I started my research, um, Barbara McCaskill had found two sources written by white abolitionists uh, um, talking, telling stories about how Ellen had had a baby when she was in bondage. Uh, to that, I found three more. So these are five different sources by white activists um, who claim to have actually, at least they all did have personal contact with Ellen Craft. Um, and they also, published these accounts after the crafts were no longer in bondage, um, when there really wasn't anything sort of in it for them to be telling these stories. Um, so I really, I wasn't sure exactly what to do with them. And But I what I ended up doing was laying them out as respectfully as I could for the reader to consider. And I, yeah. I wonder if, Ms. Peggy, if you have any responses um, to that. No, I don't. Yeah. I, I don't. It's still something that our family's researching, so I don't have any conclusive. To dovetail with that, what was the most surprising discovery as you were researching that you found that you didn't expect to find? Uh, you know, 
I this was really a research experience where there were new things coming at like left and right. I mean, with my first book, it, you know, I was in a shaker village. I had this one kind of big eureka moment, a smoking gun where I found out that the shakers actually were holding these children in captivity, the, the, the children who are being contested at the heart of my book. Um, with with this story with the crafts, it's like uh, every time I went to the archives, almost there was there was something that came up. But I, I think that the one that 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 I'll um, I'll never forget is on that same day when I found that deed by which Ellen Craft was um, uh, gifted by her biological father to her half sister. On that same day, actually, I found the mortgage by which William Craft was. Um, listed as property next to his younger sister. And this is what led to their eventual sale. To, so to see his name written, William Craft, he was 16 years old at the time, a cabinet maker by trade. And to see him listed beside um, you know, pianoforte, numbered church pews, other pieces of property, um, that was, that was uh, shocking. Yeah, I, I think it when I speak to young people today at various schools and so on, the idea that our people were considered a piece of property, it's its hard for them to wrap their heads around it. We have many discussions about that um, as they are navigating their life in a world that's very different from the crafts, but it has some of the same challenges in terms of how people view each other, how people are tending to care for each other or not. So it raises um, humanitarian and important questions that I think um, not just young people, but that we're all grappling with the worth of the worth of a life. Look what's going on around our world and you know, places like the Ukraine, Israel, Palestine. I mean, we we are we have to look at the worth of human life, and that's what I think is so remarkable about the crafts is that they not only got themselves free, but they came to get others free too. So we have a responsibility in this day and age to do more than just for ourselves. That's really lovely. And it, it feeds right into this question. I, I think you're possibly prescient. Uh, what particular aspects, and we've answered this already, you have, what particular aspects of William and Ellen's story do you think are most important for the African-American community to know and to understand? And I would add too, um, what a what what do you think it offers for those of us outside that community? Are the takeaways the same for different groups of people? I mean, you talked about overcoming adversity and determination and being an example. Do you um, and what you've just described about school children and property? But is there is there more that you might say the lessons to be learned from this book from all peoples? By all yes. People? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I think it's a huge topic. It's a huge subject. Um, Ilian has been asked how, as an Afri a non-African American, she had the right or the chutzpah, I guess you would say, to write our story. And I think what we've answered is that if you're going to tell the truth, then whoever is telling the truth must give respect to what you're speaking about. And she's done that. Um, in our own community, we're already doing writing. We're already speaking. We have incredible scholars. We have incredible things that are happening. There's never enough because we, our story is really an American story that's been left out of history. So I think, and, and it's trying to be erased today in Texas and Florida and other places. So I think everyone has a responsibility as American citizens to learn not only this story, but the story of how Black people essentially built this country and became um, individuals and groups that have been disparaged. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. And I think anyone that wants to be a truth teller, I welcome them. We do have a question about Hyde Park's Grimke sisters and whether the crafts knew them. Did that come up in your research at all? Um, so the 
there's a wonderful um, book by Carrie Greenidge uh, mm -hmm. out, um, I think two years ago, uh, about the Grimkeys. Um, they were actually active as abolitionists uh, in the decade prior to the Crafts escape and their ascendancy onto the abolitionist lecture circuit. So as far as I know, I haven't found any overlap in their in their trajectories. I don't know if you know of any, Miss Peggy, because actually no. uh, Carrie Greenidge, who wrote the Grim Key book, also wrote a book about William Monroe Trotter. I don't know if you had a chance to talk about those um, those narratives. We didn't, um, but uh, I do have the book. I have Carrie Greenidge's latest book. Her first book was called Black Radical about my great uncle from Boston, William Monroe Trotter, and she did an excellent job there. I have a question that dovetails to a previous one. And, um, and Kristen and I were incredibly fortunate to present Carrie with her book about the Grim Peace. Oh. Okay. So we know the story really well, and it's a um, another really remarkable book. Um, so thank you for helping us to tie that together, the time frame. Uh, if there is time, this is a, a live question that came in. If there's time, I would love to hear about Peggy's interaction with her teachers about history when she was in school. Okay. Um, briefly, I was able to attend a school called the Dalton School in New York City in the 1940s and 50s. So you would think that it being more of a liberal school that we would have had more African-American history, but we didn't. And we ended up with books that left out huge chunks about how many African-Americans, how many Black people in this country resisted slavery. We learned that there was slavery. We learned that maybe some of the slaves were well taken care of and that kind of thing. But I would have to stand up, raise my hand and say, not only did enslaved Africans jump overboard after being captured in Africa in the Middle Passage. So many of them chose suicide over captivity, starting with the resistance that we have had in this country forever. Black people resisting slavery, resisting hatred, resisting being murdered, killed, and lynched. So those were the things that, you know, I was from fourth to 12th grade. So things were getting a little better by 1960 when I graduated. But today I'm on Zooms with some of my classmates and they don't really remember me speaking out. They were, you know, I went to school with many uh, Jewish young people and we talked a lot about the Holocaust, but we never used the term Holocaust in relationship to enslavement of black people. So I think we have a lot of history to revisit. So it was it was tricky. Um, the teachers didn't shut me down, but I did at that time, I didn't have the actual book of William and Ellen Craft because I graduated in 1960. So I couldn't show them how my ancestors had escaped, but I could tell them about what I knew through oral history. Thank you so much. And we've come to the end of our time. We just, we have some wonderful readings ahead and we want to thank both of you for sharing the story of Peggy's really remarkable relatives, their escape and their activism. It's clearly a family tradition and um, we're really lucky to be hearing about it. As we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we've asked Ilian to do a final reading from her book. But first, um, Miss Peggy has graciously agreed to share some of her words to share a poem. Over to you, Miss Peggy. Okay, this is a poem. Thank you, Margaret. This is a poem that I wrote in 2016 when the Savannah College of Art and Design Museum graciously hosted us because it was a commemoration of the craft's first stop on their journey to freedom in Savannah. And the museum is built on what was the old b &O Railroad Station. So it was special for my cousins and me to, to be there. And they had an incredible um, presentation for us and put us up in a beautiful home. And I was looking into the fire that night and this poem came to me and I was able to share it at that event. It's called A Calling, and this was in 2016, A Calling Forth from William and Ellen Craft. Today, we stand 
our family in a perpetual circle of grace, listening to our ancestors calling to us through blood and sacrifice and communal space to rise, continue, celebrate, and persist on this continuum of collective effort and individual sacrifice, following their stepping stones to liberation. Ashe, amen, and hallelujah. Thank you. Ilion, you're muted. <laughs> Forgot I muted myself. All right. So I'll be reading from the opening of my book, Past the Overture, but actually it's an adapted version from for the Boston Globe, so it's a little bit shorter. So this is when we first see the crafts um, at 4 a.m. Uh, just before Christmas. It is pre-dawn in Macon, Georgia, and at four o'clock on this December morning in 1848, the city does not move. But the Ogmulgee River flows along the eastern shore, and so too an enslaved couple moves, ready to transform in a cabin in the shadow of a tall white mansion. They have scarcely slept these past few nights as they rehearse the moves they now perform. Ellen removes her gown for going a corset for once, though she needs to flatten or bind the swell of her breasts. She pulls on a white shirt with a long vest and loose coat, slim legged pants, and a handsome coat to cover it all. She dresses by candlelight. All around are the tools of her trade as a seamstress, work baskets stocked with needles and threads, pins, scissors, cloth. Her husband's handiwork is in evidence as well, wood furniture, including a chest of drawers now unlocked. Ellen slips her feet into gentlemen's boots, thick soled and solid. Though she has practiced, they must feel strange, an inch of leaden weight pulling each sole to the ground, an extra inch she needs. Ellen may have inherited her father's pale complexion, but not his height. Even for a woman, she is small. William towers beside her, casting long shadows as he moves. They must do something with her hair, which she has just cut, gather it up, pack it. To leave it behind would be to leave a clue. There are the final touches, a silky black cravat, also the bandages. Ellen wears one around her chin, another around her hand, which she props in a sling. She has more protection for her face, green tinted glasses, and an extra tall silk hat. These additions hide her smoothness, her fear, her scars. Ellen stands at the center of the floor, now transformed. To all appearances, she is a sick, rich, white young man, a most respectable looking gentleman, in her husband's words. He is ready too, in his usual pants and shirt, with only one new item, a white second-hand beaver hat, nicer than anything he's worn before, the marker of rich man slave. To think it had been a matter of days, four days since they had first agreed to the idea, first called it possible. Four days of stuffing clothing into locked compartments, sewing, shopping, mapping the way. Four days to prepare for the run of a lifetime. William blows out the light. They kneel and pray in the sudden dark. They stand and wait, breath held. Is that someone listening, watching outside? Just beyond their door is the back of the Collins's house where master and mistress should be asleep in bed. The young couple holding hands step to the front of the cottage as gently as they can. William unlocks the door, pushes it open, peers out. There is just the circle of trees, a whispering of leaves. Such stillness, he thinks of death. Nevertheless, he gives the sign to go. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing your words and inspiration. Those of us who pursue family history truly appreciate this family story. It's a love story, a story of American history, bravery. Uh, it's truly history making, the craft's self-emancipation, their speaking out, and so many others changed the course of history. Uh, a reminder to our audience, copies of Master, Slave, Husband, Wife, are available from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You can check it out from your library or you can purchase it from them. However you get it, I suggest heartily that you read this for continuing education and growing awareness. 
Also remember, you have the opportunity not only to have your book signed by Ilian Wu, but also personalized to any name or with any message that you would like. For more information is coming in the chat and it's going to be emailed to you with the video link um, tomorrow midday. Before we close, Christian, over to you for just a bit about the Boston Public Library and what's upcoming there. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Ilian and Miss Peggy for your insightful conversation, important conversation. Thank you, too, to each of you who've joined us here, um, whether you watched live or watch the video. Uh, before we close, I'd just like to mention that the Boston Public Library, Frida Hall, Frida All, has resources, services, and programs for people of all ages. And this month, our annual Black is Book List has been published. The link is in the chat, and that has 75 titles for children, teens, and adults, so you can click on the link and look at that online. Um, those are recommendations from the library staff. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon at another program or at your neighborhood library. Margaret, back to you. Thanks, Kristen. We at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have co-presented tonight's author talk. If you are researching a time, a person, a family, uh, a time in history, my colleagues are here to help you. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists and our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many educational programs providing skills for family historians, many of them free, like tonight's program. You'll see on screen that we provide insight accessing on accessing all sorts of records that make up America's history. Our mission and all we do is to to educate, inspire, and connect. And for you literary sorts, for tonight's discussion, we give special thanks to American Inspiration Series sponsors, Susan Kay and John D. Thompson. Book lovers and readers like them, please, all of you out there, join us for more author talks. Looking ahead on March 7, we'll hear from journalist and professor Brooke Kroger about Undaunted, How Women Changed American Journalism. In an illustrated presentation, she'll take us from the time of Margaret Fuller to the investigative triumphs of Ida Tarbell and Ida B. Wells to the impact of war reporters such as Martha Gellhorn. She will be joined in conversation by Tracy Lucht, president of the American Journalism Historians Association. On March 11, we'll hear from the remarkable James L. Swanson, author of Manhunt, The 12-Day Chase for Lincoln's Killers, about his new book, The Deerfield Massacre, a surprise attack, a forced march, and the fight for survival in early America. He'll be in dialogue with David Allen Lambert, chief genealogist um, in my shop, American Ancestors. And on March 21, author Greg Steinmetz will discuss his new book, American Rascal, How Jay Gould Built Wall Street's Biggest Fortune. For those of you interested in the Gilded Age, this financier is one to follow. Esther Crane of the Ephemeral New York website and blog is going to join him to discuss this dazzling time in American history. So back to tonight, though, Kristen and I want to thank our guests this evening, Dr. Ilian Wu and Peggy Trotter, Damon Priestley. What an inspiring conversation both of you had, um, such impactful writers, and thank you for sharing your words. We are so grateful. And to the audience out there in Zoom land, we thank you. We appreciate your interest in America's history, in truth telling, in America's diversity, good stories and less good stories, um, getting it all out there. Uh, this is how we move through time with wisdom. So uh, we particularly thank our authors tonight and we hope to see all of you out there soon again. For now, good night to everyone.